We are on the last parsha of the week, the last parsha of the of the book of um, Bereshit, which is the parsha called Vayechi. And this parsha is going to discuss two major passings in the family: the death of Yaakov Avinu, and also the death of Yosef Tzadik. And there's a lot to talk in this parsha. Yaakov is inviting the family to receive blessings. First, the grandchildren, then each one of the children. I am going to go all the way to the end of the parsha with a little short review. We are going to discuss Yosef. So basically, Yosef is born as an only child first to his mother. And right after his birth, not too many years later, his mother passes away, the very beloved son to his father, and he doesn't get along with his brothers. And the brothers are hating him to a way that as the Torah tells us in Pasha's Vayeshev, they couldn't even greet him. They couldn't say hello to him. Very difficult relationship. The father sends Yosef to find how they're doing. They throw him into a pit, and then eventually they sell him like merchandise, like a slave to the Midianites, to the Egyptians, who he ends up in Egypt, a slave to Fotifar, one of the ministers of the Egyptian government. And the wife of Potiphar gives out a rumor that he tried to rape her. He ends up in jail with the darkest prisoners. And on one unexpected day, which according to the Talmud, it was on Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, is when suddenly they come into his pit, to his cell, and calling him for an immediate meeting with the King Pharaoh. They help him take a nice air coat. They change his clothing, the Torah tells us. He comes to Paroi, and Paroi shares with them his most bizarre dream, which um, Mrs. Kemingkar wants to share a very special insight. She's very excited about it tonight. She shared it twice. I'm going to tell it to everyone. She said that why did he dream on wheat and cows? Wheat, me understand, wheat represents food. But cows, they weren't eating meat in those days. And the answer is the relationship between meat, meat and cows and wheat, because in order to gain wheat, you have to have cows to plow them. That's the insight. Closing the parenthesis. Did they I were just cows didn't... oxen or were they cows? I think they were oxen. Who knows? I don't know. Anyway, the point is that is being appointed a second to king. His brothers arrive because there is famine in Canaan. And when the brothers arrive in, in Egypt, he recognized them. They don't recognize him. And as the story ends up to be, he becomes their supporter. They come to live next to him in Goshen. And now we are coming to the end of the story when Jacob had passed away and they are returning from the funeral from Jacob. Home back from Hebron where Yaakov was buried. It says verse 14 on page 286 if you have a Chumish of Art Scroll or if you want to look in your own Chumish chapter 50 verse 14. By Yoshev Yosef Mitzrayim Uve Echov Yosef returned to Egypt, he and his brothers, and all those who had gone up with him to bury his father to the funeral of Jacob, after he buried his father. They're making their way back home. Yosef's brothers perceived that their father died. 
What does it mean they perceive their father died? So Rashi brings us from the Medrash that they used to come very often to eat together with Yosef. And he was very respectful to them. And when Yaakov died, they weren't invited anymore. And he wasn't as nice to them as he was previously when the father Jacob was alive. So that is the so-called Bayiru, they perceived, they realized times are changing. Bayoimru. So they said, when it says Bayoimru, they can say to themselves or they can say to each other. Louis the main Yosef, the Hoshev Yoshi Blonu as color roo, I shall go manu ito. Perhaps, Lou, Lou means maybe, perhaps, Yosef is now going to develop a hatred against us. And then, first is going to hate us, and then is surely going to repay us of all the evil that we did him. Basically, you forgive, but you don't forget. They saw that he might be in due to the father's respect. He was calm and nice and peaceful, but now the party is over. And perhaps is going to trouble us and revenge us for all what we have done to him this many years earlier. The Medrash also says, the Balaturim brings that, that when they came back for the funeral, they walked by Shechem, from Hebron to Egypt, they walked by Shechem and they were Next to her, they were walking by the area where Yosef was actually thrown in, the pit where he was thrown in. And Yosef was identified that pit, he went over, and he did that much halacha, the Mishnah requires you to do when you go by a place that you have experienced a miracle. He made a bracha. Baruch. Blessed is God who had caused me a miracle in this day. That's the blessing you make at a place that you had experienced a real miracle. When they saw it, they realized he never forgot that Pete story. Not only did he forget, perhaps he is reliving that all experience now after the father died. And now he's going to hate us. What do we do? That is not around. It says verse 16, by Yitzabu el Yosef Lehmoyer. So they instructed that Yosef is to be told. They didn't tell him directly. They sent messengers. They did it to a shliach. Who did they send? Rashi also brings us. They sent the children of Bila, because Bila's children were nicer to him. They had a, a better relationship than with the others. Even Bilo itself apparently was also there according to Rashi and um, she went to discuss with Yosef the following message. He tells them this is what our father said, meaning they tell him this is what our father said. Not clear exactly if he said it or they said he said it but for the sake of peace, you are allowed to deviate from the truth. But maybe he did say something like that. At least it for sure would have wanted to happen. Verse 17, what did that say? So shall you say to Yosef, Anna. Would Anna means what? Please. Sa-na. Again, na. Na means, again, please. Sana means kindly forgive. Please forgive. Pesha achecha vechatatam. Forgive the spiteful deed of your brothers, spiteful deed of your brothers and their sin. Kirog malucha. They have done evil. 
You're not denying it. The ato, and now they mention again. So no, a third time no. The pesha of day like a third time please, please forgive the spiteful deed of the servants of your father's God. By the way, the first time the Jacob's kid or anyone is titled God's servant. Till now, we never had this title. Here they refer, they represent themselves as Avdei Elikei the servants of our Father's God, which means we are the servants of God. Avdei Hashem. Later, it became a very part of our title. Hallelujah, Avdei Hashem. We always called the servants of God. This is the first time. This is what they tell him. What did Yosef do? By Yehi Yosef. Yosef is crying. The Dabra Melo. Yosef is crying when they speak to him. He can't take it. Yosef. Yosef says to them, Al Tiro, don't be afraid. What are you worried about? Ki atachat ki money. Am I instead of God? If I would have wanted to cause you evil, I would have done it a long time ago. Don't worry. I'm not doing it. And then he tells them the most powerful word, but he also said that earlier that they met the first time. In the Yigash. That you had thought and you considered it as something bad. You had considered to harm. God intended it for good. The man asoi kayoi mazdele achyois amrov. So, in order that I should be able to save many people to keep them alive, basically by sustaining them. The ato al tiro, he tells them, don't be afraid again. Onoich yachal kereschem vestapchem. I am going to sustain you and your young ones. Comfort them and spoke to their heart. He spoke words which is being perceived by the heart. So they should be calm. This is the story. A very, very important and fundamental concept in the story of Yosef. They're trying to make up. They're asking for forgiveness. Matter of fact, the Talmud in Yuma, when it discusses forgiveness due to the Yom Kippur discussion, the Talmud says that to one of the places that we learn out, that you ask someone to forgive you, you should ask them, and he refuses, you should go at least three times. Again, and then again, each time with a different presentation for him to forgive you, what is the source three? What's the magic number three? So the Gemara says, because the brothers also said the word please three times. Ana, sana, veata, sana. Three times they ask for forgiveness. Whether or not Yosef actually forgave them, according to Morse commentaries, or Achaim HaKadosh, Rabbeinu Bechaye, there was no forgiveness. Comfort them. Spoke to their heart. As they say in Yiddish, Ale Gutazach, all good things, but actual telling them, I forgive you, you don't see in any of the words. What does he say that Joseph wept when they spoke? To he him? wept because he got emotional. They suspect him for being uh, said on them. But do we say him seeing, I accept your apology? Or Chaim Akadosh says, he couldn't, even if he wanted. He says that if somebody steals money from his friend and the gun of his funds, the fund the thief, according to biblical law by a Noahite, if you steal money, you are put to death. It's in the Torah. If a Jew kidnaps another Jew, it's put to death. It's in the Torah. So, Yosef looks at them and he says, am I instead of God? 
I can't forgive you. <laughs> Whatever you did to God, you have to figure out with God. I cannot forgive. Rabbeinu B'chayi says that actually we see clearly the famous story of the 10 um, uh, mortars, the story that we read every Yom Kippur, and it's, uh, we, we say it in the, in the story, what we read in the Seder Avoda during Musaf, and we also say it during the Tisha B'Av of Kinot, we mention that these 10 mortars, which includes the greatest of the great, including Rabbi Akiva, Rabban Gamliel, right? Anani Ibn Tradio, Yishev this is like, this is like, there's no one greater than that. They were picked up by God to be the what? The representatives for atoning what the tribe had done to Yosef. Why do we need to have 10 mortars if they ask for an apology? And he said, I have no problem with you. The answer is, there was no forgiveness. There couldn't be any forgiveness. We did a whole discussion. Why couldn't he forgive? There is, Rabbi Sefer Hasidim, there is a few who do mention that obviously he forgave them. And they say, as much as they forgave them, there is still such a dent created that they needed for the future 10 mortars to um, try to atone part of it. But it's a difficult story whether or not the forgiveness actually took place. Like I said, Rabbeinu Bechai is from the Rishonim, from the earliest commentators of the Kamed. He says, no. No. Yosef is using very, very difficult words to understand. He tells them, it's all good. <laughs> what do you mean it's all good? He was ripped away from the age of 17, right? He left at 30, the best years in growth and development you know, you want to be connected to your family. He inherits his role. He had his father, Yaakov, very loving father. He was ripped away from all that. And he was suffering too. In that Egyptian cell, this is not uh, a blue collar or white collar, um, um, you know, um, uh, what's it called? Vacation place in Arizona or somewhere. It's not a five-star hotel. It's not a five-star hotel. The Torah describes it a pit. You know, a pit is a hole in the ground. They pull them out of the hole. They put them back to the hole. A big hole. Many holes. Exactly how it looked. They suffered. And yet it tells them it's all good. What do you mean it's all good? I want to take you for a moment to the Tanya. The Tanya, as many of you know, the Tanya is called Sefer Shel Beinoni. The Alter Rebbe goes on introducing the five different personalities which is in the Talmud. There is the Tzaddik, which everything is good. There is the Tzaddik, which doesn't have it so good. There is the Russia which has it, has it good. There's the Russia who doesn't have it so good. And then there is the Bainan. You know, the Rebbe basically wrote a whole book, 53 chapters, expecting everyone to become a Bainan. A Tzaddik is a gift. Once you are Bainan, God may grant you the gift of righteousness, but you can't work to become a Tzaddik. You can work of becoming a Bainan. And what's the point that the Rebbe keeps on pointing out? What's this all? direction, and the Benini, the so-called the intermediate person, which is not intermediate in a way of half and half, the Benini is the type of personality that did not change in its core. He did not change his feelings towards worldly matter. He did not change his thoughts 
which are not necessarily kosher. Meaning, in its core, the Yetzer Ara, the evil inclination by the Benoni, is fully awake, but controlled. 100% control. The moment he tried to get up, ah, knock off and cup, he gives him a Z, you go back to sleep, you're not going to dominate me. He developed himself to a way of connecting to God that he does not get practically involved in anything which is against, against Hashem's will. But does he have the motive to become something else? Yes. Did he kill his evil inclination? No. He's alive and kicking, but <laughs> subdued. 100% subdued. In chapter 12, the Alter Rebbe, when he describes this pursuit daily, he says as follows. Listen to words. He talks about in his relationship to God and so on. And then he says the following words at the end of chapter 12. Listen to the words. The words are chapter 13. Chapter 12. Oh. Abenani says, is never wicked, a no rasha, even for a single moment. Okay? Willingly, he's for sure not going to entertain it any evil thoughts. But even unwillingly, he's completely controlling it. And then he says, so too in matters between man and his fellow men. The Benoni does not grant any expression of thought, speech, or action to any evil feeling towards a fellow. As soon, the Alter Rebbe says, as soon as there arises from his heart to his mind any Eminacity or hatred, God forbid, or jealousy, anger, ain't no mekablo. He will not accept it. He is refusing to even think about it. Don't try. On the contrary, his mind will provide, will prevail over and dominate the feelings of his heart, he says, to conduct himself towards his fellow. That same fellow wrongs them, the Benoni goes and conducts himself towards them with, a qual with the quality of kindness. And to display towards his fellow a extraordinary level of love. Loilichoi without being angry over him. Beloilishalim loy. Not to take any revenge from this person. And here I come into the last five, five words. Elo Adelab. On the contrary, Ligmol lechayavim tovot. To repay offenders with favors. As the Zohar Gadol says in this parsha, Lilmod mi Yosef to learn from the example of Yosef's conduct with his brother. The Zohar, in the entire story of Yosef, goes on for weeks. The Zohar comes out with one single lesson. One single lesson. It's on page 20. 201, I think, in the door, in the original text of the Torah. He says, learn from Yosef to act kindly, kindly to those brothers who he had suffered from. And the question is, are we all Yosef? First of all, 
Yosef is tzaddik yesod olam. Yosef is the tzaddik, the foundation of the world. There's no one like Yosef. And especially, how can you expect, you want me not to repay him with evil doings? I may learn to control myself and not to take revenge for somebody who had caused me suffering. But not only does the Alter Rebbe says from the Zohar, not only should we not take revenge, hey, you, I owe you money. I owe you a gift. What happened? You embarrassed me yesterday. <laughs> you took away a job for me. You convinced somebody else to get the job instead of me. That's why I want to invite you for Shabbos. That's why I want to provide you with a, with a gift card. That's what Yosef is doing. How is it possible to pay him back with good? Says the Alter Rebbe, that what happened to Yosef. Yosef did not only not arm his brothers. Yosef is giving them, providing them, paying them, favoring, favoring them, doing all the goods for those brothers who harmed them. What's the secret? How can you do it? How can you have such approach? But the Chuma says, Alter Rebbe says, Yosef looks at his brothers and he says, here, there are two stories what happened here. There is a story what you did, and there is a story what God had intended to happen, and it actually happened to me. What you did was wrong. You threw me into a pit. You had a choice not to do it. Even if God would have decided I have to go to a pit, you can say, God, find somebody else to do it. I don't want to be the one. There's many messengers. This is what they did. They have to figure it out. You're asking what happened to me? How do I look at it? God had a plan. The plan is that I have to come down to Egypt, create a haven for you, for the entire world to create a source of sustenance for you, for the entire world, to make me this man who is in charge of this entire world, to let me assist and help others. That's what I'm here for. So as far as I'm concerned, it's the best thing what happened. So if you did something good to me, I have to pay you back. Two stories. And it's what he did and what happens to me? The Alter Rebbe actually in a letter, in letter 23, I believe, in the, after the Tanya, there is letters called the Gerat HaKodesh. In the letters, the Alter Rebbe spoke very strong about it. He wanted to explain what is the Hindush of the Baal Shem Tov. What was the novelty of the Baal Shem Tov? The Alter Rebbe brings a Gemara. The Gemara says, anybody who displays anger is like worshiping an idol. Rebbe says, <laughs> what are you making me an idol worshiper? I don't go to church. I don't believe in any of the idols. I have, no, I have a strong belief in God. And yet I got angry because somebody wronged me. Because I'm angry, the Talmud calls me an idol worshiper. What kind of comparison is idol worshiping to anger? The Rebbe says, this is not a metaphor. The, the connection between idol worship and anger is that when you don't realize that everything happens by God and God can only do things which lead to the good, so you got angry. It means that you don't believe God. Yes. Believing in God means that there's nothing what happens without God. And even that what God does is only for the good. Good. I might not see it this second, I might not see it tomorrow, but the belief system is that God cannot do evil. Why are you allowed to argue? Why are you allowed to do things that uh, Abraham, you know, to barter? You don't need to let yourself die. You have the right and the obligation and could be that this is what God wants of you at this moment. 
He wants you to dive and tell him, please change the degree. But if he doesn't accept your prayers and you're still being out of a job or you're still being out of, uh, of, 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 of a good relationship because he can't, you know, it's out of your control, the guy decided to, to act crazy against you. So you should know that ultimately you have to walk around with conviction that if God does it, it's coming from God. He is the messenger which brought it up upon me and it's all going to end up something good. And sometimes you see the good. What happened to Yosef? Yosef looks at his brothers. I owe you money. I'm not gifting you. I'm not giving you charity. I owe you. Why do I owe you? Because you brought me to where I am now. This good life I am now. A life of purpose. Yosef was not only benefiting the Kabbalah, the Zohar, talks and Hasidus brings that Yosef actually helped the Egyptian exile, which God had originally decreed that should be for 400 years, was reduced to 210. And from the 210, there was only 86 of harsh exile. What happened to the 400 plan? Yosef, being in Egypt, took care. And a lot of what we had to accomplish through the 400 years, he took care in his very being there. That he was able to help us to reduce the sentence. Basically, the Kabbalah talks about a large number of holy sparks which are scattered in Egypt and that was the purpose of the 400 years is to elevate them and to reunite them. And basically that's what Yosef did while being there working with this physical world and being involved. He was already clearing up a lot of the sparks. So when we came down, God looks down. No, it's only 400. 210 is enough. Actually, in, uh, and, and the harsh work was only 86. That's the amount of hard work that you had to go through to rectify and to purify those lost sparks. So Yosef was actually assisting the world, assisting us. He had a very accomplished life once he came to Egypt. Even his father only lived 17 good years being there. So therefore, Tal Rebbe is basically telling us, the Zohar says that we have to treat everyone with with paying them, even those who are liable, even those who are liable, we have to act towards them kindly. Question is, act towards them kindly? Be happy that I don't hate them. Be happy that I don't trouble them. But I'll tell you, no, no, no. Look at Yosef. Yosef gives you the reason. Yosef gives you the insight, the understanding, how and why should you act kindly? And the reason is because this guy is the messenger to bring you to the goodness that you are deserving, that you are about to achieve. So you're always going to thank him for it. Lin might be Yosef or Miyacho. That's the lesson of Yosef, but it's all based on the Emuna that no evil comes from above and God is in charge of everything. The fact that the, you had meant it wrong is true. And you're going to get for it. And they were punished, like you said before. To differentiate between the one who had injured you, the way his perspective on the picture is, and the one who was injured, his perspective is the novelty of the Alter Rebbe based on the Zohar in differentiating between these two cases and therefore allowing us to understand even the possibility to act kindly for somebody who wronged us. In Shira Shiri, anybody wants some tea? No one tea? In Shira Shirim, Romo Amelech always talks about 
the famous relationship between Knesset Israel, the Jewish people, and God. That's what the old love story of Shira Shirim is. In chapter 8, the Pasuk says, Mi tencha ke achli. Please, God, be like a brother to me. Does the Madrich, Dashi brings it. What kind of brother are you looking for? <laughs> if your father, if your mentor, be my brother. That's what the pastor said. Me, Tancha Ke Achli. Please become like a brother to me. Does the matter what is be like a brother to me? What am I asking God? We asking God to be to us like the brother. Their brother was to his brother. Yosef HaTzadik. We asking God, don't just be a brother. Be their brother. We reminding him there was a brother. And there was once 1961 the 13th of ER is the yard site of the Rebbe's brother. The Rebbe had a brother. The Rebbe actually had two brothers. The Rebbe was the oldest and he had two brothers. One died in the Holocaust in Ukraine by the Nazis. And one passed away at a very young age in Liverpool, England. He went from Russia to Palestine. And then he went to Liverpool for a little while. He was, a, uh, he was given the, uh, what do you call it? Like in university, uh, scholarship. a scholarship for, he was a professor in math. He was a very big professor in math. They actually had some writings of him that he printed. His name was Rabbi Srol Arya Lay. And he passed away in 1952 in Liverpool. The Rebbe worked very hard to get him buried in Israel. They actually transferred him to Tzfat, who is capable of his deal many times. So his yard site is the 13th of ER, 1961. The Rebbe sometimes spoke, but if I bring in about him, a lesson for his name, Israel and Arya. That Shabbat, usually the Rebbe used to give a Hasidic discourse. There was the talks called the Sichot. And then was a Hasidic discourse called Ma'amar. The Ma'amar was in between the Fabrengen. The Ma'amar was different than the talks. You can even see it on videos. A Ma'amar, first of all, had a song which was sang prior to the Rebbe saying the Ma'amar, a special preparation song. Not like the Sichot, by a Hasidic discourse, the Rebbe would say it completely with his eyes closed the whole time. And with a special tune. A very special tune. And all the Hasidim used to stand when they came to Amamar. They started, the Rebbe made like a, a note that he's going to say Amamar. They started singing that, that preparing song. Like a song leading to the mimer. Everybody's standing up, the Rebbe sitting, and also under the table. The Rebbe never, and you see all the videos, his, his hands is never over the table. It's always under the table. He used to quietly, you notice every time before a mimer, take out an handkerchief and tie it around his finger. All done, but by Hasidim, it was known that when, when, when you want to make sure that you don't uh, expire, you all that to something physical, <laughs> something tangible, because the Rebbe used to get in, you can see in the videos, go on YouTube, put in Mimer, you're going to see the Rebbe is like an all different world. Even after the heart attack, he had over here the doctor, the cardiologist of the Rebbe, Dr. Weiss, you remember me, brought him into the Torah Center? His speech, by the way, is on Chabad.org. The only speech from the doctor is what he gave over here at the East Side Torah Center. You can find it on Chabad.org. So he then said that they were watching. The Rebbe came down. They gave permission after a month after the heart attack to give a brain. I think it was maybe the 19th of Kislev. And um, 
and, and they were watching with monitors, you know, to see the heart. So that, that they put like a little machine and they were sitting upstairs and, and monitoring the situation. And then they suddenly realized it's all still. That doesn't mean that at both flat level they came flying down, thinking the worst that happened, that everything the mind. When they said the mimer, the poles were all, anyway, it's all different reality. But the Rebbe said a mimer in his room, not in Afabregia, before Davini. And the mimer, he discusses this verse in Shira Shirim, Mi itencha ke achli, God bim abrodot. And he explains that the idea that, we are, that what happened to Yosef is not just Yosef. Yosef in Egypt is every Jew. We are all Yosef. Who is Yosef? And who is Egypt? Yosef is the neshama, the soul. And the soul is being sent into jail. By Tifar takes us as slaves. The body takes us over. The animal soul takes us over. We end up in jail in Mitzrayim. Yosef is in Mitzrayim. But those who are responsible for our for our situation. And obviously, the world out there is sending us, is watching us, is basically, you know, not helping the situation. And God is looking down, and we tell God, Allah, look, we might have did wrong. We took Yunashama that you gave us. We are the brothers now also. Right? We are the brothers. We took the neshama you gave us, the Yosef, and we kept them in jail. We didn't develop the neshama the way it was meant to be. We didn't elevate the neshama the way it was meant to be. We are the brothers of Yosef who are harming the neshama, which is Yosef. What do we tell God? Yes, we are. And you're going to behave to us like Yosef behaved to his brothers. What did Yosef do to his brothers? First of all, he provides us for them, despite all this trouble, physically what they need. So you, God, make sure that we have what we need, physically. <laughs> exactly. Give us a line, a line of credit with no limitation, because that's what Yosef did. Yosef helped his brother to realize their mistake. He helped them to do tshuva, right? When they said, last week's parasha, we seen with the child, he brought them to say it. So God, help us do tshuva. You want us to return? Assist us with that too. That's like Yosef helped his brothers. But not only that, Yosef showed his brothers that even the bad thing would happen is also meant to be good. So God, you know that after all, that we're going to repent, what happens to our sins? The real repentance takes our sins and it transfers them to goodness. We don't just get rid of sins, we change them, we can transfer. The Talmud says, if you if repentance is motivated by love, you can change inequity into merit. <coughs> so, so that's what you should do to us. That's what Yosef did to his brother, that do to us too. So then why the 10 martyrs? Why did God? Uh, because that they are what they did. What they did is what they did. <laughs> they have to pay for it. But we are not looking what they did. We are looking for how Yosef looks at it. I don't have a watch here. What time? No. Eight? Eight. <laughs> First days? But in other words, what comes out interesting is that everybody is Yosef. In the one end, when we ask God to be like Yosef to us, so we're calling God to be Yosef. He my brother, like Yosef to his brother. So God becomes carries the time to Yosef. In the other end, when we are expected to behave towards those who wronged us with kindness, then we are becoming like what? Yosef. So the children are Yosef. 
the person will be wrong is also Yosef, right? It's like, you can call the old family, Bukhaya, the, the family called Yusufov. They are all Yusufovs, they are all Yosefites. <laughs> Used to be the old Jew. The early years, there was not too many people, there was a table and there was maybe about four Moshe's. There was Moshe and Matul and Moshe was Kedosha. There was two Russian Moshe sitting next to each other. One a tall one, one a short one. There was Moshe and Kedosha. There was maybe later Moshe Benochum. There was not Moshe. Every time you was a small place, yeah, Moid, Moshe. Everyone's screaming their head. Everyone thinks he's going to get the Aliyah, right? <laughs> And I remember he, he said that the, the, the Romanian Moshe used to say, Alle Eden Moshe, all the Jews are called. That's this, you know. And, the, and it's true, they all called Moshe. They all called the ice. There was a verse in Tehillim, chapter 80. The King David, the sweet singer David Amelech says, Roe Israel Azina. The shepherd of Israel, please listen. Noeg Katzon Yosef of Fia, the one who leads his sheep, who are the Yosefites, please make an appearance. We are the Yosefites, says Rashi and Tehillim. Why are we all called Yosef? We are called Israel, we are called the uh, Yaakovs, Bnei Yaakov. Why is David Abelach giving us the name Yosef, the Yosefites? <laughs> because if not for Yosef, says Rashi, we wouldn't have been here. Just because it took care of our ancestors 4,000 years ago, that's why we are, have to be called Yosef till today. The answer is, it's not that he caused us to survive only physically dead. Today, to go through Galut, to go through exile, to deal with all the difficult elements which a Jew has to deal with, is being sustained and supported by Yosef. Yosef gives us the core. Take it simply. You ask someone, how are you going to raise a normal Jewish child in Bellevue, Washington? The only answer we're going to get, which makes sense, is going to be what? What's the only answer you're going to get? The only answer you're going to get? Yosef did it in Egypt. Okay. We have a figure. We have an example to follow. He did it, even, even Yaakov did it too, but Yaakov, after all, was the son of Yitzchak. He lived next to his father. He was, a, you know. Yosef was alone, alone. Alain, Alain. And he did it. What do we say every Shabbat comes from this week's Parsha? People have a tradition to bless their kids Friday night. Not Shimon and Levi, not the Sacha of his fuller. Ephraim Menashe. With Ephraim Menashe, that's American chocolate, Nikes, with an American passport who were watching the Mariners games in Egypt. They are the children that we are to all look up and hope that our kids are going to grow up like Yosef. When it comes to be able to be normal to somebody else who has wronged us, wouldn't we get the koach? Yosef. Who gives us the perspective that even when things are bad, you should look at them, that they are leading to something good? Yosef. Who do we turn to God and say, Please be nice to us, even when we wronged you. Iten hake achli. Yosef. Yosef. Without Yosef, we are not going anywhere. I always wonder if Parsha ends up. Yosef died, the last verse. And he was played by Yisem Be'aron Be'mitzrayim. And he was placed in a casket in Egypt. That's the last three words of the Parsha. What is the response after such an end story? What do you say afterwards? Mm -hmm. No, that's not natural. 
What should we all say? Oh, very, 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 something. Instead, what do we all say? Whoa, how powerful it is. What do you, what, what's the power of Yosef's death? In general, we know that you're not supposed to end the story bad. Judaism is a very important concept. The signing the talk. The conclusion has to be good. You have a bad story, you have a whatever harsh word we use, the end has to be with good words. And here me ending an entire book. Very sheet, it's a bad ending. Yosef died and is in Egypt. That's not right. That's how you finish the story. That's how they're gonna walk away from Bereshit that Yosef died. The answer is that Yosef being in Egypt is the best, most inspirational information you can share with anybody today. You tell him Yosef never left us. In Egypt, he's still with us. He's in Egypt. In our limitations of Mitzrayim, in our boundaries of Mitzrayim. Tzadik Yesod Olam. This is Yosef Tzadik, the only one who carries the name Tzadik. We don't say Shimon Atzadi, we don't say, I mean, uh, from, from the from the tribe, we don't say Avraham Atzadi, we don't say Moshe Atzadi, we don't say Avon Atzadi. He's a Rabbeinu, and he's a Kohen, and he's a Vinu. All nice types. Who carries the name Tzadi? Yes. This is the story of Yosef. This is the inspiration of Yosef. Went back, went back to become a slave. Only one time, Yosef. No, Levi. Ah, Levi. Yosef, Levi was able to leave. Yosef, 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 the kid. Oh, he was able to leave. The kid was the child. Mentioning everybody was to say, what do you mean? After when Yosef passed away, right? But mentioning every who become a slave, right? If they never was a slave, who Yosef say that? No, because it doesn't that one thing doesn't have to be the other. There was a decree, no, if he died, that period ended. After all, there was a mission, which is next week's parsha. There's something that we need to accomplish now in Mitzrayim. We are not done. There is a job. There is a Moses who has to be born. Slavery, which has to take place. This has nothing to do with Yosef. Yeah, it says in the Zohar, actually, that because Yosef was sold by his brothers, meaning they took kind of control over him, they dominated him, and it helped us that, that Egypt couldn't take fully control of Yosef, because he's already pre-owned, so to speak, by his brothers. And that helped us that even when Yosef is in Mitzrayim, he's not completely on the Pharaoh's hand. He has his own belonging somewhere, the one who is like mastering him prior to, to Pharaoh. That's why but, Pharaoh was happy that the family came down because he figured that they would buy into Egypt. They would all be apart together. Right. It never worked. No. That was the problem. That was his problem. Chazak, chazak. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah, all have light? I don't know. But maybe not. Came back, I hope. What is the deal when the light went off in the neighborhood? My, my, not my slide, I don't know my slide, but it was, uh, what do you call it? Small detector started all beeping like crazy. Because the power went out. Right, so what? They have a sensor in it to say that the power went out. Now they're going to be making me crazy all the night? <laughs> no, you take the battery out. How could you? Ours isn't bad. You take what? the battery out. I took the battery out. Have it in my pocket. No, it's One not minute. beeping. No, it's not beeping, but it's still making a lot of noise. It's singing. It is? Yeah. <laughs>
Okay, guys, you understood what's going on over here? Arnold. Yes, my friend. Oh, class. What? I didn't see you. I've been here the whole time. Picture up there. What? How's it going? It's going. Everything okay? Alice kid. Alice kid. Baruch Hashem. The telephone is not mine. The telephone is Alicia Kaminkar. My telephone did not work. Maybe now it's working. Because you... the, the light was off in the neighborhood. There was a blackout on the entire uh -huh. 148. What, today? Now, like it started, I was in the middle of a class on Zoom, a quarter to six, suddenly it's all dead. And until uh, eight o'clock, it's still gone. I don't oh. know. And now yeah, maybe I'll come right. off. I had, I had trouble getting on, onto the... Um, uh, the program this evening, and, and I, I phoned Karen to say I uh, maybe five ten minutes late. Actually, I was on time, but it all seemed a problem. Yeah. Don't, 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 Alicia, you need the telephone. Thank you, guys. Forget, I will see you later. Rabbi, you, 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 you're going to email me the, from Chaim's telephone. You were going to email me Avram Chaim's telephone. Oh, yeah. Thank you for reminding me. I will. Besides, thank you very much. You and so, uh, what, what, to be, what are you doing for your wife's birthday? Eh? What? What are you doing for your wife's birthday? I'm doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be a, a nice Yiddish on Shabbos. You're right. I ordered a right. cake for you. We have three birthdays. Okay. I have Shabbos is my daughter. It goes one birthday Shabbos. after another. Who's my my uh, Sarala's birthday is Shabbos. Yes. One second. Today is Yud Beis. Today is Yud Alex. Tomorrow is Yud Beis and Gimel. Yud Alex. Sarala is on Shabbos. Mina, my daughter in law, is on right. Sunday. And Mrs. Farkas is on Tuesday. On which day? One cake. I killed three birds. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> last year I did, uh, but the, last year we had a nice uh, latest event, but now uh, right, okay. right. Last year I tried On to find Zoom. Zoom. Yeah, now no, no. We, we came, yeah, we came. But that was a big party. That was for a special day. Now I told him, but she turned sixty. If she still stays with me, I will make it another. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're going to be putting up there. But we're going to have a nice cake, Shabbos. We might even, I even, I think my one of my kids wants to make order sushi. Mm -hmm. I'm hopefully, I'm a herring. Give for me the same herring. But uh, but for those who like sushi, there's going to be some sushi, Shabbos. It's herring. more important to have, have schmaltz herring. Huh? More important to have schmaltz herring. <laughs> Come to shul, you're not going to miss. I won't miss. Blin Adam. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you very much. Oh, ho. Hi, David. Thank you.